slowing his game down, he is ramping it up, he's getting busy, and he is at work. There's some things that are coming into your life, and I need to be the one to tell you, and then I don't want you saying, oh, see, if Pastor never said that, it would have never happened. No, it's going to happen. I just want to prepare you so that when it happens, you're girded. You're standing solid on two feet. You're not going to crack down. You're not going to break when the enemy makes his move against you. I could be talking to myself. I don't know what the devil has planned. But what I do know is that I have a great big God and who's able to take care of us, take care of me. So I want to talk about it. I want to mention today, we're going to talk about three things before we actually talk about the armor. Um, three things that Paul teaches us about in preparing to fight this battle and in fighting this battle. Three things that Paul gets us ready for when we fight against discouragement, when we fight against depression, when we fight against doubt, when we fight against despair, when we fight against darkness in your life, when we, when we fight against death, difficulties, all these things in our lives, delays that come, uh, slam doors, all those things uh, that come in our life. Paul tells us there's three things we need to know before we begin to partake in on this side of the battle. Notice that I, the things that I mentioned, I didn't mention he teaches us how to fight against the KKK. No. I didn't mention that he teaches us how to fight against the government on Occupy Wall Street. That's right. Get your, get your guns and everything. I didn't tell you that he teaches us how to fight against the gangs in our neighborhood with guns. And with, he teaches us how to fight against things that are often right here. Depression, those are spiritual. These are spiritual in nature. They're not fighting against other people. So there's three things I want to talk about this morning um, that if we're not prepared for, we will fall down flat just like the Twin Towers fell down. So we're looking today, and the first thing that Paul, I'm gonna, I won't be too long, Paul talked to us about is that we have to be dressed for battle. We have to be clothed and we have to be ready to go into battle. We cannot go onto the battlefield naked in your underwear. It doesn't work. We mentioned that a little bit last week. You are either crazy or you're not seriously about, serious about warfare if you would go onto the battlefield in your pajamas. You're not serious. Nobody, I don't think your opponent's going to take you seriously. When Goliath called, when David was brought to the battlefield, Goliath saw David, and even though David had all that armor on, Goliath still laughed at him. Your enemy will laugh at you if you are not prepared because he knows vulnerability. He's looking for vulnerability, and the fact that you haven't cared enough to cover your vulnerability pretty much sets the target. You definitely let your enemy know where he gets you when he sees you on the battlefield. If you're on the battlefield with no helmet, your enemy said, I'm going for the head. If you're on the battlefield with no breastplate on, the enemy says, I'm going for the heart. If you go into battle with no, your low men's on a girt, he's going straight to your character. He's going to test your integrity. You've got to be suited, and your enemy needs to see that you're suited. He needs to know. Otherwise, they won't take you seriously. Um, and we talked about it last week. You could not get on that NBA football field. It would be illegal for you to run out there in flip-flops. They wouldn't let you play. That's a football game. The U.S. military would not let you go into battle representing them in football. Believe me when I tell you this. The Lord Jesus Christ will not send his soldiers on the battlefield not prepared and not dressed correctly. So what happens is, if you're not ready for battle, you're a passive Christian. What happens to passive Christians? The Lord says he'll take care of you. He'll do Listen. I hate to be the bearer of bad news again. If you're a passive Christian and you're not serious and you have not got yourself in the Word and you haven't fasted and you haven't prayed and you haven't covered your family and you are ready for battle, you will get hurt. The blessing of that is, is that the Bible says to be absent in the body, we talked about it last week, is to be present with God. You can't move because even though you're going to die on the battlefield, the, the, and another thing about passive Christianity, sometimes you don't die. What you do is you leave your family exposed. And not only do you get beat up through life, your children probably never come to know the Lord. Your relationships continue to fall apart. You will still be susceptible to every physical attack of the enemy if you're just a passive Christian, not ready for battle. Don't get in your head that God is going to take care of me. He's going to take care of me, but not the way you need, you think you need him to take care of you. He will, he will be victorious in the end, but we said it earlier. I have to work out who's on soul salvation. Mine. I've got to be in front of God. I've got to be seeking him diligently to allow me to stand. So, uh, we're not crazy. 
Um, but there is collateral damage in this spiritual battle scene. Unfortunately, I've been in church a long time. I've seen many souls come. I've seen them beautifully saved. And I've seen them horribly fall over the years. Just because you call yourself Mr. and Mr. Christian does not mean that you're not going to be a part of collateral damage. It happens. It's the reality. And, the, and even if you're a soldier, you, you're susceptible to damage. If you're not a soldier, you're susceptible to damage. The difference is, if I'm a soldier and I'm ready to defend, I will be probably the last guy the devil chooses to run up on. He may run up on me anyway, but he's going to get the he's going to get the ones running out there with the loot first. Get get yourself ready. Get ready to glorify God. Get ready to let your life stand to be a monument of glory and praise and honor to God. And you do that by obeying Him. And Paul tells us to be ready. Don't go into battle naked. So, um, there's a term we learned years ago. Tim's not here this morning, but I know he's heard it. Some of you that may be ex-military. Suited and booted. You got to get ready for war. You better get those boots tied up. You better get suited and ready for combat. Amen. And that's, that's the way we need to look at it. And that means you never go into battle with flip-flops. And you never allow yourself to be vulnerable. Even if you're on the offensive, you want to be dressed. You may be attacking your enemy. You need to be cold. You may be fleeing from your enemy. It really doesn't matter. As long as you are ready to engage at that time comes. Pastor, we're not supposed to flee. The Bible says resist and he'll flee. I'm going to say this to you. Sometimes, you better know when you step away and get yourself together. Get your head together. Sometimes resisting the enemy means you may, you may need to step back and get away from that temptation. Get away from that, that trick, that snare. So, yes, for the most part, we want to see him fleeing. But the wisdom in that is knowing when you need to step away and not engage the enemy. That takes great maturity to know when the devil is attempting you. To be able to let go and step away from a situation and not allow your flesh to get you into something you don't need to be getting into. So, um, flee, whether you're chasing or whether you're fleeing, be suited and be ready. Let me read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. A final word, Paul says, be strong with the Lord's mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies and tricks of the devil. Right. That you may be able to stand firm against all of the strategies and tricks of the devil. All it takes is one good trick from the devil to put you down on your back. Yes. You know that? That's, right. That's why Paul says all of his tricks. Nor do not get me through most of them. No. You need to get through all of them. One good bomb on the side of the road will finish you off. You've got to be diligent. You've got to be able to avoid every trick of the enemy. And I hate to tell you this, guys. You were born into a battle. Whether you're a Christian or not, every, all of mankind was born into this battlefield. All of us. You didn't ask for it, that's what it is. You were born into a cosmic battle. It's an unseen war, it's an invisible war. From the time you came through your mother's room, I'll say this, from the time you were in your mother's room, right. the war to kill you has been ongoing. That's right. So, and especially in this country today with abortion so high, the devil is killing children before they even enter into the world. So I want to encourage you, there is an unseen war between good and between evil, between light, between darkness, between Satan, between God. There is a war that's going on. This is just for some people that have not heard this kind of talk. And I don't want to be just one of those Christian churches that just talk about love, 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 love. I need you to understand there is a war. There is hate, 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 hate out there. That's why we love, 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 love in here. So I want to get you ready to understand that this is very, very real. There is an enemy that's out to destroy your soul, and you've got to be ready for it. However, however, uh, the, the war between God and Satan, they are not equals. Not even close. Satan is far inferior yes, to God. He is. The Satan is a created being. God is a creator. Yes. God is one zillion times greater in power than Satan ever will be. And one day God intends to completely and fully wipe them out. And we often talk about it. Christ has already won. Yes. You believe that? Yes. He's, already, he's already been victorious. So now what's happening is that Christians have to stand with Christ in that victory. If Christians don't stand with Christ in that victory, they're going to be left out of that victory. That's what God's watching for. Are you going to stand on this side of the battlefield? 
Or you going to engage in the trenches and, and, and do all the dirt that the other side is doing? Whose side are you going to stand on? That's all God has seen. He's dividing the wheat from the tear. He's dividing his army from Satan's army. Because when destruction comes, it's coming suddenly. Give God your battles. And you stand in your place for him. When he's ready to roll that trumpet, when he's ready for you to move, you move. So we, we have to, to get ourselves together. And Christ has already won. But um, God allows us this time to choose. He allows us to make our choice who we're going to serve. And I'll say this also. Uh, love is not really love unless you choose not to love somebody. Unless you have rather the choice not to love somebody. Angels choose to love? No. Angels choose to obey God. And they're messengers and they're instructed by God to carry out His work. But angels don't engage in love. They're loving. They're real. They're the angels, the good guy. They don't care whether you... They don't care. Uh, I love when Joshua stood before that angel. Are you standing... Who are you? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? What the angel say? I'm not for you or your enemies. Joshua, I don't care about you. I don't care about your enemies. I'm God's messenger. I'm God's angel. And when God says cut, I cut. Whomever he says cut, I cut. That's how God... God is a, There's a strict rule of law in heaven. And we play around with a little pseudo thing going that we have. There's strict law in heaven. When God says to do something, angels don't mess around. And, and Joshua said, whose side are you on? You for us or our enemies? I love the statement. I'm not for you or you. And I know I put Joshua right back in his place. Okay. In other words, who are you for, Joshua? Who are you standing with, Joshua? Man. Are you going to obey God or are you going to obey man? Are you going to tremble at the voice of God or tremble at the voice of men? You make the decision, Joshua. And I love later on in the, in the book of Joshua, Joshua says, Choose ye this day whom you'll serve. He learned that lesson, whether it be God or man. The choice is yours, but I'm going to choose. For me and me and my house, Amen. we're going to Amen. choose to serve God, Almighty Amen. God. Amen. It's a choice. And that's what's left. That's what's here for us to choose. That's what Amen. we have to decide. So God gives us the choice of good and evil. Satan, however, uses people as pawn. He plays the game, and he, he, he knows that he can't hurt God. And whenever you can't hurt somebody, what do you usually do? Go after the ones that they love or they care about. Amen. If you can't hurt the person directly, you always go after the ones they care the most about. Amen. That's why it's also very important that you all that are able to put on your armor and get ready to, to fight, you do it for your family also. Your children won't probably know how to pray right until they get to be teenagers. And even then, they mess around until they're 20, 30 years old. And even then, Shante, we're not guaranteed our kids are really ever going to care about those things. So they need to be covered. They need to be covered in prayer. They need to be fought for. You've got to fight for them. It's not just protecting your flesh. You've got to have your kids right by you and fight with your kids under you. Hopefully your husband got your back and both of you can fight on two fronts. Or if you're a single parent, your church is behind your back and you everybody. If we all get in a circle and fight together, it makes it easier, amen? amen. And if I'm all by myself in an alley, getting jumped on every side with my kids, it's much better if I got a family of the warriors that are praying and covering the backside of me while I'm fighting this way. Amen. Always cover and always be willing to defend one another. But Satan... Well, come after your children, he has no shame. He goes for the kid. Notice this, though. Paul goes on to say this. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand against the strategies and the tricks of the devil. The devil's real, saints. He's not fake. He's not a joke. Nothing to play around. He's no laughing matter. I know a lot of times, especially this time of year, we get red pajamas. Get some pajamas. I've seen the pajamas with little tails sticking out. Come with a pitchfork. You can buy little horns. Kids play around with red suits and we make fun and we laugh at the devil and how cute he is, the little devil. I'm sure he is. You know, I saw you do you. <laughs> um, um, and, and I remember going to Tempe, and for some reason, Arizona has embraced this idea also. There was a stadium right down the street from my home called Diablo Stadium. Diablo means devil. Uh, the university in Tempe is called Arizona State, the Arizona State Sun Devil. So uh, we can play all we want, we can laugh and make light of the devil. Isn't he cute? Didn't he this? No. you got to take him serious because guess what? He takes you serious. Amen. He hates you. Can't Amen. stand you. He wants to destroy you. Amen. And we have to come to grips with that. He wants to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy our careers. He wants to destroy our children, our finances, yes. our lives. He wants to displace you from God's will for you. Yes. He wants to get you to leave the place God told you to be. 
He wants to get you to speak against the boss that God told you. He wants to get you to do all these different things because he knows if he can just get you out of God's will and separate it, he's got you. Amen. Don't play around with your enemy. He's, he's patient. He's not kind. He is patient. That's one of the fruits. I don't know why he's got that fruit. He shouldn't have that fruit of the Spirit, but he's got patience. He, he, for hundreds of years, he'll wait for you. Before you even born, he's telling your grandparents what he's going to do to you. And you know, hopefully your grandparents aren't unselfish and they find him then or else. Uh, remember what, he, what it was it? Hezekiah? They told him, uh, the Lord or the prophet Nathan, or what, what, what's going to happen to me? Don't worry, Hezekiah. God's going to take care of you. But your grandchildren or your children are in trouble. Guess what Hezekiah said? Oh, that's all right. But Hezekiah said, you know what, Lord? As long as you're pleased with me, and as long as something that I can control, I'm going to give you my glory. That, that's okay with me. Um, but, but keep that in mind. So, um, we've got to stand up against the, 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 the enemy. Notice that it says the strategies and the tricks. King James Version says the wiles of the devil. I don't know if you guys really know what wiles are. But that's what they are. They're strategies. They're tricks. And this idea of tricks is, is, is consistent uh, uh, throughout paganism. But keep in mind, saints, it doesn't just stop. It didn't start right on Halloween. It started as the scripture tells us about. So, he's subtle, saints. He's strategic. He's smart. He's faster than you are. Don't try to outsmart him. The devil will beat you every time in your flesh. In your carnal mind, there's nothing you can do to handle the enemy. He's going to win. He knows your most vulnerable spot, as we said earlier. He knows exactly what you, what, where you're exposed and what he can do to hurt you. Um, the only thing you can do is to put wisdom on the devil. And whenever wisdom turns on, it's like the devil fighting into the sunlight. That's what wisdom is. When you're walking in wisdom, the devil can't see you. He can see something up there. He knows you're there. But it's like you look him looking directly into the sun. Wisdom, wisdom turns the lights on. The devil doesn't walk in the wisdom. He walks in folly and foolishness. He encourages others to follow us into darkness. But when a, when a warrior and a saint of God is, 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 is backed by the Lord, that brightness that comes from God, whenever you use God's wisdom against your enemy, he's, he, he's vulnerable. That's his most vulnerable moment. So use wisdom, saying, Don't try to use your logic. Don't try to use your reason. Use God's wisdom. Amen. Amen. And you'll, 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 you'll do well. The scripture goes on, uh, I'm going to, 1 John chapter 4 and 4. We did say it earlier, the bad news is that you were born into the battle, but the good news is, saints, is that you were born to win this battle. You were born and designed to win this battle. Okay? You were born and designed, you possess the most sophisticated technology on the battlefield today. The blood of Jesus Christ. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. They were walking in obedience to God the best they could. If they stayed where they were supposed to, they made it. But today you have the most sophisticated. In other words, in the Old Testament, they didn't do a lot of the fighting against the devil. They fought natural battles and, and God trained them and did some things with them. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have the, the ability to fight uh, spiritual oppression like you have today. You're able to go places Moses could never go. You're able to go places Elijah could never go. Joshua could never go. Nathan can never go. David can never go. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, you are the most sophisticated warrior the universe knows. You got to know that. You got to believe that about yourself. There's nothing more powerful than you in the universe if you're in Jesus in Christ Jesus. His blood is the most sophisticated weaponry. What does that mean, Pastor? That means that if you know who you are and know what you're able to do, there is not a battle in this universe that you could not wage and come out victorious in Christ Jesus. Amen, Lord. Amen. All right. Maybe I'll get that next week. We shall learn that. I think that's exciting. Amen. But the problem is the church is too defeated. We're not winning the wars against the small foxes. And because we're compromising with the small foxes in our lives, we're not growing to that place where we're true warriors fighting his battle. We're still fighting our little pay foxy battle. Get rid of those weights that so easily beset you, those things that bring you weight. Get make you heavy. Get those foxes. Stop playing those games. And get that stuff out of your life and stand firm. 
on the God of your salvation. Know who you are. Call out your enemy in the name of Jesus. See, a lot of times we don't do that either. It's foolishness. I'm not going to tell you it's not. It's very dangerous to call out a demon if you're not ready to fight a demon. Be very careful. And I don't mind. I don't, I don't have you want to stay quiet in that area? Just stay quiet. You hug on up on Sister Morrison. <laughs> you throw a prayer out for me this week. That devil mess with my marriage. You do what you got to do. You get close to those, those that know how to pray. But I'm telling you this. The quicker you're able to stand up on your own and call the devil out yourself, that's the day your children can say, Hallelujah! That's the day your husband can say, Amen! That's the day your church can say, Alright, now it's on. But too many people are cowering, hating, retreating against the enemy, afraid and scared of him, thinking that if they just hide themselves, he'll pass them over. He ain't going nowhere. He's got, he can see through walls. He knows where you are a mile away, and he's coming after you. That's how you gotta look at it. You better pick up that sword and start building muscles. I carry this golf club with me every morning when I walk with Joshua. I'm like, man, where you got that? Oh, I'm not letting the dog run up on me. Somebody let the dog out at night, and I have nothing. I'd much rather have a golf club with my dad. But when I get up in the morning, I start swinging the club. I tell Josh, get away. I'm going to swing it for a minute. And I swing it so my joint, you know, my tendons can stretch a little bit. I get that weight on that thing, pull it. That's just a golf club. And sometimes I'm like, if this were a sword, I wouldn't be able to do nothing. I'm so weak. <laughs> but the swords are heavy. And you got to know how to wield it. You can't get into a battle and call yourself trying to fight a sword fight. You're not, uh, uh, you haven't built the muscle memory to do it. You got to fight. You got to, you got to cut. So um, keep 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 that in mind, Saints. The Bible says uh, you have you have the most sophisticated weaponry. First John four four. Greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. The blood of Jesus will defeat every every demon that comes your way if you trust in it. But you got to trust in it. Satan's not afraid of you, Saints, but he is afraid of the God that's inside you. He is terrified of your God, and your God is confident enough in you. Stand away and let you fight your devil. The problem is when that devil gives you a good pop, you get mad at God and you say, Why didn't you stop me, Lord? The Lord is trying to tell you, I need you to grow up. I need you to defend yourself. And, and that's the problem. We get mad at God sometimes. But your God is a great God. And when the Spirit of the Lord is in you, you have no reason to be afraid of any devil. No battle and no distress or battle can come up on your life. Let me go to the second point. I must know my real enemy. That's number two. And the second point is, I've got to know the real enemy. I've got to know who my enemy is. Um, it's very discouraging going into a fight and not knowing who your enemy is. I remember watching Aliens. You know how Aliens, until the last part of the movie, you get to actually see what you're fighting up against. Or for half the movie, all you see is shadows and noise. Or watch your friend get sucked into a dark corner and blood squirt out. You don't know, what am I fighting up against? And then they went a step worse. They, they came out with Predator. And Predator is invisible. I mean, it's not only that he's out there doing the dirt. He, you, you can't see him. And that's frustrating. So I'm for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Can, can you imagine being Arnold Schwarzenegger? With a, a crazy monstrous uh, alien predator out trying to kill you? That's, that, actually, that's a low light, toned down version of spiritual warfare. Right. You cannot see your enemy unless God exposes him to you. Yes. So you got to pray constantly. Let me see my enemy. Yes. There'll be people you'll come up to and you'll have a smile, they'll have a smile, but the minute you get three feet from them about to shake their hand, the, you can just feel the spirit say, mm, uh, yes. something is not right. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. is not right. And your warrior instinct raises up and all you can do is shut your mouth and just keep praying. You smile, you gotta shake it, you gotta shake it. It's too late. <laughs> this turn up, turn a bad situation into a good one. Yes, How you doing today? But you got to know, you got to know your enemies are trying to approach you, and they're approaching you, and they're all around you, and you got to be able to see them. And that's what Paul tells us. Tells us always look and ask God to expose those enemies in your life. Amen. A lot of times we think that enemies are other people. That those are our real enemies. A lot of times we think that our enemies, are, the economy is our enemy. We think sometimes that uh, 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 political parties are our enemy. Sometimes we think that, 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 well, who's the real enemy? 
Who, who's the one that's really causing all the mess in the world? Who's the one that's, 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 that's changing and messing up all the mess of different people's cultures? Who's the one that's blinding people and causing them to hate and fall into all these traps? Is it the Republicans? Is it the Democrats? Is it the Tea Party? Is it the Wall Street protesters? Who is it? Who is my real enemy? And we're looking and we're looking and always looking for somebody to, to blame or to pin the blame on. Is it the gay agenda? Is it the, is it the uh, 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 atheists? Are the atheists our enemies today? Is it the Christians? I'll tell you what. You'll get cut, you get hurt in church sometimes more than you'll get hurt out in the world. But who is the enemy? Who's the real enemy? And in every case, I will tell you, in every one of these cases I mentioned, I will tell you that you're wrong. Those are not your enemy. Those are people that God wants to save and that God died for. All of them. The Democrats, the OWS, the Christians, the atheists, those that carry the gay agenda, though even the abortionists. Those are all souls that God intends to save and he died for every one of them. Those are not your enemies. Let me read Ephesians chapter 6 and 12. It says this, we are not fighting against people. If you think people are your enemy, get your eyes off the people. Don't try, don't waste your effort on people and flesh. Don't do it. The Bible says that um, people made up of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world. Those are your enemies. Evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. In other words, spirits. The Bible goes on to say this. Against those mighty powers, King James says principalities, simply means mighty powers of darkness and rulers of this world, and against wicked spirits. Wicked spirits, not those, not Gabriel or, 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 or uh, Michael, don't worry about them. But those wicked ones that are powerful as powerful, there are other ones you need to worry about. So, we're not a match for Satan. Um, you're no more of a match for Satan. It's like shooting, if you were going to fight Satan, it would be like shooting a rubber band at a battleship. How much damage would you be able to do against a battleship with a rubber band? I'm not being silly. That's the reality. You try to fight the devil with your flesh, you won't, you won't do anything to him. You may as well have a rubber band trying to take down a battleship. It's not going to work. So we need to keep that in mind. The devil is not afraid of us. He's afraid of who's in us. I want to say this. Slow down for just a second. Everybody gets played by Satan. Everybody on, on Occupy Wall Street is getting played by Satan. People in the Tea Party are being played by Satan. Catholics are being played by Satan. Protestants are being played by Satan. Satan doesn't have a respect of culture, class, race, gender, ideology. He does not care. And he has infiltrated everything you possibly could think would to be reserved. Even the church itself. Christians get played by Satan. We know this to be true. We know this to be a fact. But you have to, I'm not saying this to discourage you, you simply have to be aware that the devil is everywhere. Even in your four-member, four-person family structure, guess who can get in there and play you? Yes, he can. You have you, your honey bunny, and your two cute little babies under 10 years old, guess who will get right in the middle of the play? Don't think there's anywhere you can go and be, I'll say this much, you'll be in solitary confinement. In the deepest dungeon, deacon, all by yourself, and guess what? You'll get played by Satan. That's who you're fighting. He will find a way to get in here, and he will mess you up. He'll mess your life up. So Christians get used just like everyone else, and they have to also defend themselves. And and actually, real Christians do. It doesn't take them long. They start putting their shoes on. It's so cute. Watch the saints come into church, and they can't. You can't separate them from their Bible. That's exciting. Then you watch other Christians been in here. They're pretty much teenagers in Christ walk around the house naked. <laughs> then you got some babies in Christ. Got boots on already. Can't hardly walk in the boots. Dragging a big old sword behind the little shield. Trying to carry a shield. The helmet is bigger than half of their body. Looking crazy, but you know what? They're being obedient. And I guarantee you they're not going to fall. And like I said, you have 20 year old saints. Sitting up here running around their thumbs, looking at them like looking at the babies like all oh, their overzealous. They'll snap out of it and no. 
They're getting ready. They know who they are. See, there's a church, there's a real church, and there's a church. And the real church does not take this battle lightly, and he, they are ready for it. So, um, you've got to be able to, to stand. I know the devil, the devil will get in your mind. Sometimes he'll put stuff on your mind, and that's really where he fights. In the mind. Even in a believer, absolutely. And I know, me for a fact, I've said some things, looking back, I know I've said some things to my wife. That the minute it came out of my mouth, she knew it was from the devil. And the look on her face made me realize it was from the devil. And I'm not talking about tone either. I'm not talking about how I said it. Girl, my food! I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about saying something like, we're never going to get out of this hole of debt. Our kids are always going to... Same negative thing that came from the enemy. And sometimes I'll say something and I'll look at her and I know here comes the spanking. Baby, don't say that. And why? Why is that? That's because that's how quick the devil works. Yeah. He'll get in your mind so quick just to let you say something in a moment of discomfort. Yeah. He'll let you say yeah. something that will jeopardize your future. Right. Jeopardize your victory and your success in tomorrow's battle by letting you think or say something today. You gotta be on, you gotta be ready for him. You gotta be ready for every attack that he has against you. So also understand that everything out there, every spirit is not a good spirit. Every spirit out there is not a good spirit. There are some wicked spirits out there. There are good spirits. There's also some bad spirits out there. You've got to know that everything that's spiritual is not good. There's righteousness and there's evil. Unrighteousness. And just because some, something says I'm spiritual or I'm good, that's, don't believe it. The Bible teaches you what to do. You look for the fruits. And those spiritual fruits, those fruits that are going to be beneficial, not just to you, but to everyone around you. If you see people hurting other people, you mark them. That's right. You mark them quickly. Now, I'm not telling you to fight them or start getting in their face to defend somebody else. No, but you start praying right then and there, Lord. Don't let the strong hurt the weak. Yes. The Bible already told us that the strong should carry and build up the weak and not to hurt the weak. But when you see stronger people hurting weak people in church, yes. you rise up against with everything you have. There's no excuse for it. Always stand up. For, 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 for weakness when it's available. When, it, when it's vulnerable and you're, you're able to do something. So, um, number two, we've got to know who the real enemy is. And another thing before I finish this point, the devil does not fight fair. He's not a fair fighter. A lot of the times, he's, he puts those ideas, he'll put things in your mind, and you've got to close those doors. So this battle is a spiritual war, saints. And you're in it, and it's a mental battle, you've got to get conditioned to fight it. you got to be ready to stand against the pressure. Yes, you may feel depressed. Sometimes, before I go to the blood of Jesus, I go to an enchilada dinner. Uh, and that's me. And I know what my body tries to make me do. When I start feeling funny, they got thrifty ice cream right here, right on the block now. Double chocolate malted crunch. Usually, you saw that? Yeah, I know. They got thrifty ice cream right around the corner, and I love these some double chocolate malted crunch. The devil's bothering me and I'm feeling heavy. Guess what my flesh is going to tell me? Go get you a double scoop. A double chocolate. That's not going to get it, saints. Eating's not going to get it. Going to the movies not going to make the devil leave or go away. When that heaviness comes upon your life and you start slipping into depression, you better stand on God's word and on His promise. And you tell the devil what you need to tell him. And he starts coming in your mind. And he starts, you just can't seem to breathe. Your heart is so heavy. You got all this fear and frustration. You put on that breastplate of righteousness. You suit up. And you get ready to stand against him. Um, so be ready, saints. At all times, be ready. Stand against him. Number three, and this will be very quick. You've got to use every piece of armor that God has told you to use. All of it. Put on the whole armor of God, the Bible says. Not just some of it. Don't run out on the football field in your full uniform and you still got flip flops. <laughs> Guess where your enemy's going to aim? Right. It doesn't matter if you have some of it on. If there's parts that are vulnerable, that's going to be the target and it will, you will fall. So make sure that you're, you're dressed. Ephesians chapter 6, 13. Use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy in the times of evil. And this is what it says. So that after the battle, you will still be standing firm. That is where victory is. In the ability to stand firm after the attack. If the devil comes, the devil goes, and so you may have your helmet on backwards, your sword may be bent and broken, 
your leg may be hurt, maybe walking like this, but if you're still standing, you're victorious. The Lord, the Lord doesn't say cut off the head of the devil. The Bible doesn't tell you anywhere to cut off the head of the devil. Who cut off the head of stepping on the head of the serpent? Jesus already did it. He's defeated. You have to understand, the devil is now black and blue. He's already been defeated. To us, us that are in Christ Jesus, the devil doesn't want to fight us. If he can avoid us, he will avoid us. The only reason he wants to engage is because he knows that you're going to go take some of those souls that he has back for Christ. That he won't let you do. So he will engage you if he knows that you're offensively going into his territory. But if he has a choice, he's not going to mess with a powerful. And that's why I like the church to say, the devil comes out to the church first. They will always attack it. And this is true. But the reason is because the church is going into his territory. The gates of hell can't hold back the blood of the child of God. And it's to keep you from going in and taking back those souls that he has already claimed. That's why he doesn't like you. That's why he'll gang up on you. He'll try to get you. But it doesn't matter how many devils he brings to your house. If you're standing firm in God's word and people, your people, saints are backing you up in prayer... You can chase a thousand away. Yes. Two can chase yes. ten thousand away. Yes. That's who you really are. That's right. But that's if you know who you are. Amen. And that's the big if. If you know who you are, uh, trust me, the devil does not want to tussle with you. But you've got to know who you are, and that means you've got to let your flesh go. Yes. Stop cussing at your husband yes. so he'll know how mad you are. Yes. Yes. Stop throwing stuff just so somebody will know, oh, they're serious. The Bible doesn't mention yay be yay and your name be nay. It doesn't say, let the frying pan tell him the serious. It doesn't say it. Now I know he will get the point if a frying pan goes flying past his head, but all that's going to do is invite retaliation. It doesn't invite the love of Christ and the peace of Christ. It removes it actually. And every demon of anger and wrath is waiting, is licking his chops to destroy your relationship. You've got to get flesh out of the way and get into spiritual warfare and be a praying person quietly or loud. We got to try that sometime. Girl, I want my food. I want an apple. Come to Jesus, Lord. Jesus. Give me a man that's going to love me, Lord. Give me a man that's going to take care of me, Lord Jesus. Start praying out loud if you have to. I don't know what results you're going to get. If my wife did that to me, I'd be like, all right, we'll go to McDonald's. Don't tell Jesus on me. I, that scares me more than anything. Uh, I don't want my wife praying on me. The Bible talks about uh, one of his coming to him with tears. Yeah. Woe is the one that brings those tears and that, that grief into the life of his baby. I don't want to be. I don't even want my children going to God. Oh, my dad is so abusive. <laughs> I got to be careful. I don't want none of you all doing that. So prayer is your greatest weapon, Satan. And God says that we have the victory already. Yes. So if you want to fight, I want you to fight say, from victory, not for victory. Fight from a place of victory. That's why I say stand firm. You fight from victory. In other words, Jesus has already lifted you and put you on a pedestal. You just stay right there and you fight. Everything he brings your way, you're on a solid foundation, you're not going nowhere. You're on that hill. You're on that rock. The minute you step off that hill for a minute and try to go down, you're exposed. That's right. Stay in Christ. Stay in Christ and stand firm. And that's where your victory is going to come. If you can stay on that hill, it doesn't matter how bad you get beat up. If you're still standing, you're victorious. Amen. In Christ Jesus. So we've got to stand. You know, I love the scriptures that having done all to do, stand. Stand. All right. So let me give you just a little background as we close. This week. Just for a second. I'm done. Um... Paul writes in this passage, he's writing in this passage um, from Ephesus, and in Ephesus he's in prison. He's actually in prison because he's, it's time for him, he's actually appealed to Caesar, and he's being taken to Rome to stand trial in front of the greatest uh, political leader in the world, Caesar. And, and, as, he's, and he's, as he's in jail, he writes this letter to the, to, um, to the saints, and as he's in Ephesus. So he's been taken prisoner. And for 24 hours, understand this, he's under guard, supervision. For that entire, all the, the fullness of his day, there is a guard with him right outside the 
sale, or he's usually even tied directly to a car. Very rarely does Paul go anywhere without his guard present. That's, that's, those are his conditions. So for 24 hours a day, here's Paul. Even as he writes, he's got a Roman centurion standing in front of him. So as Paul is writing, um, he learns, actually as he's living among the soldiers of Rome, he learns military protocol. He gets a chance to see this army. He gets to see it close up. He gets to actually see them engage in fights and do different things. And he watches and he sees them. And he understands the military protocol. So as he's writing to Ephesus, he's under guard and chained up by the Roman centurion. So as he writes, um, I can just imagine him looking up. And as he's considering this war that we're in, in the spiritual, looking up at this centurion and describing the weapons and the tools that you're going to need uh, to fight based upon what he sees this Roman soldier wearing. And he's, I believe, divinely inspired by what he sees, and he starts writing it, um, this guard, this weaponry that's being used to protect the soldier, and he starts writing about it, and he spiritually uh, parallels the armor that the soldier's wearing to what a saint of God should be wearing. And each piece of that soldier's armor is a metaphor. Um, you don't necessarily look at the helmet that the soldier's wearing and say it's to protect your lion. No, the helmet is to protect your mind. Okay, so that it's, it's metaphorical, but that for the next couple of weeks we're going to go through each piece. And we're going to really just pinpoint it and knock it down and look at it and see what it means and what uh, God intends it for. How does it protect me against depression and despair? How does it protect me against doubt, difficulty, and all these different troubles that come into my life? So, with this in mind, Paul sets his heart to God, and he sets his pen to paper, and he begins to write what I believe is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the power of a spiritual warrior needs to be positioned before God. What a spiritual warrior needs to read. Ephesians is a great book, but chapter 6 is powerful. Until we get to Ephesians chapter 6, really the Bible has only described us, for the most part, as a bunch of lambs being scattered. The Bible says that they'll be slaughtered all day long. And all the way through the Bible, the Bible talks about the Christians as being slaughtered. And this is still true in the natural. God never told you naturally to rise up. But spiritually, he, he invites you to engage in the spiritual battle that's already been waged. And allows you to participate. And you participate by first suiting up the battle. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise this morning.